Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named Girl From Nowhere Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first episode begins at what is said to be Thailand's purest high school of the year, where students would meditate on the ground to cleanse their souls. This meditation program was designed by Teacher Win, whose concept was praised by both the principal and the female leadership, adding prestige to the school. They were even considering promoting him. When the principal asked if there were any other suggestions, a female teacher proposed a plan to promote safe sexual practices. The principal and other leaders frowned upon hearing this. She wanted to install condom vending machines in the school to educate the students about safe sex amidst their natural urges, to prevent any mishaps. The female leader was utterly against this idea, finding it disgusting and an encouragement of sexual activity which could tarnish the school's reputation. Despite the female teacher's explanations about the importance of her proposal, the leadership wouldn't listen and even considered firing her. At this moment, Teacher Wynne stepped in to suggest a yoga class to divert the students' attention and subdue their sexual urges. The principal agreed to this idea, oblivious to the fact that Teacher Wynne was a wolf in sheep's clothing. The new semester has begun, and the girl, Nano, has transferred to the high school known for its purity. Her homeroom teacher is none other than Teacher Wynne. He planned to have some students record videos in the yoga studio, performing a few simple poses. The student Ng was the first to raise her hand to sign up. However, it seemed Teacher Win wanted more participants. At that moment, the transfer student Nano raised her hand to join. Teacher Win thought to himself that this girl was quite cute and a perfect target for him. The female teacher asked May if she wanted to participate since she had some background in yoga. Yet May's eyes were clearly troubled. Only fear was visible in them. Teacher Win decided to take Nano and Ng alone. Ng appeared to be overly eager to interact with him, like a puppy seeking approval. Nano also wanted to interact more with him, but only to make him suffer a bit more. The two girls were quickly taken to the yoga room. The first day involved only some basic poses, but Teacher Win was already figuring out how to make his move, just waiting for the right opportunity. Back at home, he transformed into a warm family man. He was the idol of his daughter's eyes. She even wrote essays about her father. At the same time, he was the perfect husband in his wife's heart. The family seemed harmonious, which just showed how well Teacher Win played his roles. On the second day, Nano tricked Ng into thinking the filming was canceled, leaving her visibly disappointed. May seemed to have something to tell Nano, but couldn't find the words. Nano went to the yoga studio on her own, also lying to Teacher Win that Ng couldn't make it. Teacher Win thought this was a stroke of luck and decided to film Nano alone. After setting up the camera, his true nature began to surface. He slid his hand over her body under the guise of teaching her yoga poses. He then started by inappropriately touching Nano, who was drinking water with a straw. He shockingly decided to share the straw and drink after her. He then embraced her and tried to kiss her. Nano calmly asked if the teacher wanted to do this to his student. As Teacher Win moved in for another kiss disregarding his role as a teacher, Nano wanted to confirm if he was serious one more time. But Teacher Win mistook her words as playing hard to get and got excited, not thinking too much about the consequences. Eventually, he even undressed, and they turned their yoga lesson into a hormone yoga session, all recorded by his camera. Afterward, he told Nano to meet him at the same time the next day, thinking everything was going according to his plan, not knowing the painful price he would pay for his actions. Meanwhile, May had something on her mind she wanted to discuss with the female teacher. She started with a hypothetical that if her friend accidentally got pregnant and the baby's father didn't want to keep the child, what should she do? The teacher saw right through May, suggesting that if the surgery was really necessary to get rid of the baby, she could accompany her. May quickly clarified it was not her but her friend, then hurriedly ran out. At the door, she ran into Nano, who was waiting outside. Nano told May where the surgery could be done, and this became their secret. In the afternoon, Teacher Wynn came looking for Nano again. He reminded her to be on time for the meeting, a message that was clear between them. Hearing this, Ng was visibly jealous, not realizing that Nano's deceit was actually protecting her. This time, Teacher Wynn didn't bother hiding his intentions. He took Nano straight to a secluded room. Once inside, he started to make his advances, unable to contain his predatory instincts any longer. Moreover, he showed Nano the video from their last encounter. 
Nano repeatedly reminded him that what they were doing was wrong, urging him to stop now while he still could, warning of serious consequences if he didn't. Teacher Wynne, however, threatened Nano the footage from the other day would be exposed if she didn't obey, and she would face dire repercussions. So it was that Nano silently endured a second violation by Teacher Wynne, all the while harboring a plan of her own. On the way home, Teacher Wynne's smug expression was evident, but his wife barely paid him any attention. Instead, she handed him his phone, which she said a student named Nano had returned. Furthermore, she mentioned that Nano was upstairs playing with his daughter and they would all have dinner together shortly. Teacher Wynne panicked. He tried to find a way to send Nano away, but soon realized he was no match for this devil in disguise. His wife commented on Nano's good figure and suggested she should join them sometime, saying it would be fun for all three to film together. This suggestion terrified Teacher Wynne. Nano continued her assault, praising Teacher Wynne for teaching her many difficult yoga poses, which were quite exhausting. The implication of her words was obvious. His wife took a liking to Nano, even suggesting she become their daughter's tutor, leaving Teacher Wynn powerless to stop it. Nano's plan for revenge had begun. Not long after, Teacher Wynn received an email containing audio recordings from their time in the secluded room. He was completely out of his depth, realizing he had met his match. Nano now controlled everything, yet Teacher Wynn still tried to threaten her with the video. However, these threats were useless against Nano, who had other means to make him suffer even more. On another front, Teacher Wynn's daughter and her boyfriend were secretly dating at home. The two middle schoolers were already engaging in puppy love, unbeknownst to their parents. The boy clearly wanted to take things further with the daughter, but Nano suddenly appeared. She asked the daughter if she wanted to go somewhere special for a lesson. They ended up in front of a door marked with numbers. Nano led them inside to a place that didn't look at all suitable for studying. Then, she made an excuse to leave for a bit, telling them to study alone in the room for an hour. It was clear what Nano intended by leaving them alone, even taking the daughter's phone to ensure their isolation. What would happen next was predictable. The boy wanted to spice things up, and with the two of them alone, the atmosphere turned intimate. The daughter, unable to resist her boyfriend's advances, did not push back but allowed him to get closer. However, Nano was watching everything unfold. On the other side of town, Teacher Wynne received a call. Nano had asked him to come downstairs to meet her. But when he got outside, Nano was nowhere to be seen. He turned back with a puzzled look and suddenly realized something. In a flurry, he rushed back towards the yoga studio. As he hurriedly returned, the lights went out all at once. Nano was sitting just above him. The tables had completely turned. Nano had many ways to torment Teacher Wynne. She intended to show him something interesting. Nano turned on the projector, and Teacher Wynne watched in horror as his own daughter was violated on the screen. Unable to contain himself, he frantically dialed his daughter's number, but it was Nano who answered, even mimicking his daughter's voice. Teacher Wynne, pushed to his limit, pleaded with Nano. She demanded he show more sincerity. Watching his daughter about to be completely devoured, Teacher Wynne had no choice but to get down on his knees and beg for Nano's mercy. Nano ordered him to hand over his computer password quickly, or else his precious daughter would lose her innocence. Then a burst of sinister laughter followed. Nano successfully accessed the computer and found videos of May being violated by the teacher. She copied them all. Suddenly, the boy received several messages. The daughter snatched the phone to look and found it full of videos of her father violating May. Her world collapsed in an instant. Teacher Wynne came over and without a word started to beat the boy senselessly. He blamed his daughter for being so filthy, but she retorted by asking what he had done himself. Realizing his daughter had seen the videos, he ran out to stop her, but her heart was too broken to listen to him anymore. In a moment of desperation, he slapped her, completely shattering her trust in her father. A crashing sound suddenly rang out. Teacher Wynn couldn't believe the scene before him. His daughter had been struck by a vehicle and lay on the ground, covered in blood, never to wake again. His impulsive acts had led to his daughter's death. The following day, a horde of reporters descended on the high school, clutching even more outrageous videos in their hands. As it turned out, the female leader and the principal were also caught up in scandalous activities within the school. Now, every student, teacher, and member of the wider community was aware of it. The school, once proclaimed the purest in the nation, had its reputation thoroughly tarnished by Nano's revelations. Nano, in her own way, punished those conscienceless perverts. The second episode begins with Nano transferring to a new high school. Every passerby glanced at her. She became the school's belle overnight. At this high school, their basketball team was famous and the key players were adored by the schoolgirls, especially the team captain, Hawk. 
He was popular because he was handsome and good at basketball. Even so, he was drawn to Nano's unique beauty. He quickly called his buddies to sneak a peek at Nano. The three of them drooled over her profile. Such a stunning girl was indeed rare. All three wanted her for themselves. When Nano turned to look at them, each thought she was looking at him. Just then, the coach appeared from behind and gave each a loving smack. These three were the school's troublemakers. Even the teachers couldn't handle them. Seeing the chubby girl laughing so happily, Nano asked if she liked them. Of course, the chubby girl had a crush on handsome guys, but with her chubby looks, how could she compete with the other skinny girls? The chubby girl was wandering around the campus, bored when Hawk suddenly called out to her, presenting her with a box of cookies. The girl was incredulous, thinking that the handsome guy wanted to crush her chubby body. Then Hawk pulled out another box of cookies. The chubby girl thought to herself, how did he know I could eat so much? But Hawk intended the second box for Nano, because she was Nano's good friend, and it wouldn't be too much to ask her to be a wing woman. The chubby girl's face fell instantly. In anger, she threw the cookies at Nano. Nano told her to go ahead and eat, as she didn't like cookies herself. Hearing this, the chubby girl nearly cried out of frustration. She'd rather starve than take this insult. However, Nano suggested that maybe she wanted to diet, which the chubby girl couldn't tolerate. Looking at Nano's smug face, she ran out, fuming. After school, Hawk and his friends stopped them and he pulled out two concert tickets, offering them for free on one condition. They were to bring Nano to the party he was hosting at his home. The chubby girl, still somewhat rational, knew their intentions were to get Nano drunk and take advantage of her, so she returned the tickets. Initially, as Nano's friends, they were kind-hearted, but the chubby girl's jealousy was starting to surface. Everyone approached them solely to get to Nano, making her uncomfortable. The classmate Tail thought she was overthinking it. After all, Nano was a good friend. The next day at school, Nano found a bunch of white roses on her desk, sent by Hawk. Without hesitation, she pressed down on the roses, eliciting a pained expression from Hawk, who was far from enough to win Nano over with such a simple gesture. Tail found the roses quite pretty and thought it a waste to press them down. Nano told her to take them if she liked, as she hated roses. Hearing this, the chubby girl rolled her eyes and could no longer stand Nano's attitude, joining others in slandering her online. The campus forum's comments about Nano grew outrageous, something most people wouldn't be able to tolerate, but this was Nano, who they didn't realize could be quite terrifying when provoked. Hawk's friend suddenly approached Tail after school, asking her to tutor him. They worked on the lessons together, laughing and chatting, appearing well-matched. However, the friend's gaze began to wander. It was clear he was there for Nano, who smiled back at him. Tail realized they were up to something when she noticed his eyes never met hers. Tail, who usually defended Nano, was now angry and stormed out, crying alone in the bathroom. The chubby girl who understood her feelings the most chose not to disturb Tail and let her cry freely, proving her genuine love by waiting for her. After crying for an hour, Tail emerged from the bathroom, feeling utterly transformed, and decided to join the chubby girl at the concert, meaning they were both harboring ill intentions towards Nano. However, Nano was fearless, knowing the risks, but still choosing to face them head on. She could even outdrink the guys who plotted to mix all the drinks to get her completely drunk. The chubby girl took out a box of sleeping pills, intending to knock Nano out by crazily adding them to her drink, even putting in five pills. At that moment, Tal suggested a toast with Nano, who accepted the challenge as always and downed the drink. Seeing no immediate effect, they went for another round. After finishing it, Nano leaned on the table, seemingly passed out drunk. Hawk got excited, planning to take advantage of the situation, while the other two started arguing about who should go first, with one even saying that he should go first because he was the smallest. Hawk lifted Nano onto the bed, his eyes fixated on her seductive form. For someone as lustful as he was, holding back was not an option. Desperate to unfasten her clothes, he was caught off guard when Nano, who he thought was asleep like a pig, turned her head and opened her eyes, challenging him that he should ask for her permission first. Taken aback that Nano was awake, Hawk hurried to apologize, but apologies weren't what Nano sought. She wanted her consent to be asked for. So Hawk asked her whether to proceed with his exciting intentions. Nano didn't provide a clear answer, but walked to the door and swung it open, revealing the others who had been secretly listening outside. Confronted, they encouraged Hawk to do what he had intended, insisting that today, Nano must face the consequences. Emboldened, Hawk embraced Nano and threw her onto the bed, assaulting her without a second word. At that moment, Nano burst into laughter. Thinking she was mocking him, an enraged Hawk covered her mouth with his hand, but her laughter did not cease. 
In a more violent turn, Hawk strangled her, and Nano's laughter was replaced by silence. Her expression turned to one of terror, her eyes bulging as if they might pop out until she breathed her last. Shocked by the turn of events, Hawk froze. When the others heard the noise and rushed in, they found Nano motionless, strangled to death. Panic set in at the thought of being discovered for murder. Lost for what to do, and as high school students who had never encountered such a scene, one of them suggested they just bury the body, her eyes resolute with determination. So they went to the wilderness to dig a hole, and the boys dumped Nano into it. Only then did Hawk start to sincerely apologize to Nano, but what good were regrets now? They might as well bury the body quickly to avoid future troubles. Nano's body was engulfed by the dirt, her eyes still open as if she had something to say. Suddenly, she gasped for air, showing that she wasn't dead yet. The boys wanted to save her, but the girl who had suggested burial was determined to finish the deed. If they didn't, they would be the ones going to jail. So they all acted together, beginning to bury Nano alive. Despite having the chance to atone for their actions, they chose the most foolish path. Hawk was now the most eager in burying her, making his apologies as worthless as flatulence. Eventually, Nano was completely buried. Hawk knelt down again, apologizing while the others followed, claiming it wasn't intentional. The following day during class, both of the two girls glanced at the seat next to them as if by some unspoken agreement. Shadows of doubt and fear lingered in their minds. The boys on the other side felt much the same, all too distracted to focus on the lesson. Just then, a familiar figure drifted past. In unison, three heads lifted to look. The person who just passed by seemed oddly familiar. At that moment, Tail and the chubby girl were also startled. There stood Nano, seemingly unscathed as if nothing had happened, making her way to her seat. They couldn't fathom how Nano seemed to be immortal. Nonchalantly finding them, she even remarked that she had a great time last night and they should include her again next time. They couldn't believe that Nano before them was real. Frightened to wet their pants, they hurriedly fled for their shitty lives. The group gathered to discuss the day's supernatural occurrence. They had buried Nano with their own hands. How could she just reappear alive? As the bell rang, Hawk opened the door and there was Nano looking for her phone. She came in and laid down on the bed, clearly remembering what Hawk had done the night before. Next to her, a phone recorded evidence of their crime implicating everyone. If this video got into the hands of the police, the five of them would be behind bars for a long time. But Nano was still taunting them, once again taking control of the situation. Upon hearing her, they pressed her down on the bed and smothered her head with a pillow. Afterwards, they drove Nano out into the wilderness once again. Since she didn't die the first time, they decided to bury her a second time. This time, Hawk went down to check if she was really dead. Suddenly, Nano rose and grabbed Hawk by the neck. He struck her in the face with the shovel, but then another unharmed Nano walked out. Now there were two identical Nanos, and they couldn't tell if they were dealing with a person or a ghost. They took the shovel and killed the other one. Then another Nano appeared behind them. This time they were completely petrified, too scared to even strike. Their only option was to flee in their car in a panic. A new day has begun, and Nano still appears before the chubby girl and tail. Her figure will become their lifelong nightmare, punishing those who deserve retribution with endless cycles. In this world, people are always apologizing, as if making a mistake and then saying sorry is enough for forgiveness, only to continue making the same mistakes. After all, as long as one can apologize, it seems to be okay. However, some mistakes cannot be resolved with an apology. Every revival of Nano actually gives these people a chance, yet they only keep apologizing without taking any concrete actions to correct their wrongdoings. The third episode shifts to a principal giving a passionate speech on stage, while the girl, Boone, sneakily runs to the restroom to put on makeup, accompanied by Mew, who is also skipping class. Both are known as poor students in the school, which is why they naturally get along and hang out together. The school Nano transferred to this time is one with clear hierarchies. Many excellent students have their photos posted on the wall and leave their handprints, a great source of pride for the students. Mew and Boone, although poor students, also yearn to have their photos on the wall and leave their handprints. Compared to these geniuses, Mew feels like a waste. At home, she often feels a lot of pressure as her mother nags her and compares her to other children, which hurts Mew deeply. Fortunately, she has her best friend Boone, whose grades are even worse, so there is no competition between them. However, the teachers are not so gentle with them. As poor students, they are only treated to scolding without a trace of a smile from the teachers. To encourage them, the teachers even compare them with Nano, who became an excellent student within two weeks of transferring. 
That's not surprising, as someone who can't even die getting excellent grades is as easy as writing. Yet the teachers smile at Nano, and excellent students even get special gourmet food. The two mock the teacher's recent demeanor, but Mew could never imagine that she would end up being the clown herself. Soon after, the teacher shared some fantastic news with the class that they had a new honor student who clinched first place at the Thai Literary Association. Mew looked around, puzzled, but she was floored when the teacher announced the winner's name. It was Boone, always considered a notch below her, now the class's new star. Mew couldn't share in Boone's happiness, her heart brimming with envy. She found it impossible to accept this turn of events. Boone had naturally left her handprint, as the teacher's completely transformed attitude towards her became evident. Descending the stairs, Mew's eyes fixed on Boone's photograph pinned to the wall, a wave of bitterness washing over her. She placed her hand over the freshly inked palm print, and before it could set, began to furiously smear it, recalling Boone's past words to her and feeling a deep sense of betrayal. Anger bubbled within her, the desire to destroy the handprint growing. It was almost as if all she needed was a spark to ignite her darkest inclinations, and that spark was none other than Nano. Nano confided to Mew that there was a reason Boone could write a novel in such a short time. Simply search online, copy and paste, and voila, it's done. Mew realized with a start, thinking that Boone's work might be plagiarized. But calling it plagiarism seemed too harsh. Nano suggested it was more like drawing inspiration, tweaking someone else's work and making it your own so no one would notice. For Mew, it was worth a shot. If she succeeded in art, she could enjoy wealth and glory, and if caught, the worst she'd face was a scolding, a risk she was willing to take. Following Nano's advice, Mew found a painting of flowers, printed it out, randomly splashed some paint on it, and claimed it as her own. However, when it came time to submit her work, she hesitated, fearful her inspired piece would be discovered. Seeing this, Nano fanned the flames, praising the painting's beauty and suggesting it was printworthy. The teacher, intrigued by Nano's comments, couldn't wait to see it. With no other choice, Mew reluctantly handed it over. The teacher scrutinized the painting, and Mew braced for criticism, but to her surprise, the teacher praised it as excellent, even suggesting it be entered into an art competition. Mew quickly became the focus of the entire class. Clearly unprepared for the current turn of events, her painting, however, won first prize in an art competition. She finally made her mark and had her picture hung up on the wall, achieving her dream of becoming an honor student. She even became the school's first art honor student, naturally turning into a key figure for the school to cultivate. The teacher's change in attitude towards her is self-explanatory. Boone sought out Mew, hoping she would no longer be angry. Since they were all honor students, she suggested they should be friends again. To everyone's surprise, Mew retorted that she didn't consider herself to be on the same level as someone who plagiarized others' work. In the days that followed, Mew began to live a life of pretense, becoming adept at lying. The other honor students were eager to see her next painting, and they wanted to see it that very evening. For a true artist, this might present a challenge, but for a copycat, it was a matter of minutes to find someone else's work to copy and paste. Adding a unique touch with her signature secret paint created her so-called distinctive style. Every piece Mew posted received countless likes, and she even began to boast, claiming one should never underestimate human potential, stating she painted her latest piece with her left hand. Many artists reached out to her, praising her work. Her fame even led to a television interview for the school. In front of the camera, she styled herself as an artist, but behind the scenes, the printer churned out copies, her efforts at mimicry almost comical. Nana watched all of this with a knowing smile, aware that life and death are unpredictable. The school was soon to host an open day where the work of honor students would be showcased. Nano timely suggested that showing Mew's already displayed work would be dull. Consequently, the teacher decided to have her paint live on stage. Mew felt no one would be interested, but her classmates were curious about her process. She couldn't face the embarrassment of declining, but standing on stage to perform was a recipe for disaster. With no alternative, she attempted to paint, but she couldn't produce anything. Revealed as a mere copycat, actually performing on stage would spell her doom. At the critical moment, Nano even called to mock her, revealing that someone had discovered Mew's plagiarism. But Mew was too preoccupied to care about that now. Her main concern was to figure out how to avoid performing on stage. So, she came up with a twisted solution. Boone was summoned to the bathroom where she was practicing in front of the mirror, hoping to reconcile with Mew. Mew confessed that her previous anger was just due to jealousy. Boone didn't take it to heart, focused only on rekindling their friendship. Mew agreed to be friends, but on one condition. Boone had to help her by breaking her arm with a hammer. 
She admitted to Boone that she couldn't actually paint and that all her works were plagiarized. Breaking her arm seemed like the only way out of performing on stage. Boone thought Mew had lost her mind. How could she bring herself to harm her friend? Seeing Boone's hesitation, Mew grabbed the hammer and smashed it into her own arm repeatedly until she could no longer hold a paintbrush. Boone rushed to stop her, but Mew turned around and accused Boone of doing this to her. Boone was dumbfounded. The frame-up was indeed clever. The scene looked just as if Boone had been the one to strike the blows. Mew lay on the ground, calling for help in agony. When the teachers arrived, they blamed Boone without a second thought, especially with Mew fanning the flames. Boone was unable to voice her distress, wishing she had actually used the hammer on Mew's head instead. Back home, Mew appeared relaxed. She had finally found a way out of performing. However, one can only avoid their fate for so long. The teacher, along with Nano, came to visit Mew, still hoping she would have the opportunity to perform. But seeing her struggle to even move a finger, they thought better of it. That's when Nano suggested she paint with her left hand. After all, Mew had boasted about it on social media. Faced with Nano's relentless logic, Mew fell into despair once again, and this time, she truly had no escape. The open day arrived quickly, and Mew was still trying to find a way out of performing on stage, but Nano's exaggerated introduction on stage had the audience brimming with anticipation for Mew's performance. Seeing Mew hesitate, the audience started to cheer her on, except for Boone, who couldn't hide her smirk, eager to see Mew embarrass herself. Just as Mew was about to start painting, a student burst forward, accusing Mew of plagiarizing her friend's work. Mew was panic-stricken, on the verge of tears. The principal, in an effort to protect the school's reputation, began to blatantly lie, tearing up the photo and accusing the accuser of being a troublemaker from another school, and therefore untrustworthy. The student challenged Mew to paint right then and there to prove her authenticity and not hide behind silence. The crowd's chance for Mew to demonstrate her skill grew louder. With no other choice, she hastily began to paint, quickly reproducing the pattern which was totally different from the original. But the principal declared that this painting was identical to the one in question, showcasing an incredible ability to twist the truth. Unashamed, he even praised Mew's talent. The student protested by saying that these two works were nothing alike. But how could a student's word stand against the principal's? She was promptly escorted out by security. The principal and teachers shamelessly took pride in their deceit and even had Mew give a speech. On the podium was a speech prepared by Nano, and in the end, Mew chose to follow the script, continuing to craft the image of herself as an artist, never admitting to her plagiarism in front of the camera. Everyone in the audience clapped and cheered, except for Nano and Boone, who knew the real truth. Boone looked around at all the hypocritical faces and realized just how despicable the world could be. Nano, having completed her mission, was ready to move on to her next school. Before she left, she dropped a line from Mew that she wished her happiness and joy. The moment Mew chose to hide the truth, her life was doomed to be void of real happiness and joy. She would forever live in fear of being exposed. The fourth episode begins with Nano transferring to a new school. Many of the classrooms have been donated by students' parents. According to the rules, you can buy a classroom and even have it named after you if you're willing to pay. This piqued Nano's interest instantly. After all, she could do anything. Not just a classroom, she could buy the whole school if she wanted to. However, Nano had her eye on a messy, vacant classroom. Buying a classroom as soon as she transferred was a move the teachers had never seen before. Quickly, the once messy classroom was cleaned up and transformed into an office-like space. Nano handed over a few bundles of cash to the teacher and from then on, the classroom belonged to her. Student Dino brought two large bags of souvenirs for his friends. These four friends are all from wealthy families, with a severe case of one-upmanship, even when it comes to buying souvenirs. When they all showed theirs, they felt embarrassed. They were completely outdone by Dino this time. His friends described Dino as rich, from a powerful family and very generous. Some said he was too arrogant, always showing off, but that's understandable. Wealthy people love to flaunt their wealth. Then Nano made her entrance. She introduced her new office to everyone, and before she could explain what it was about, it was time to start class. The teacher handed out exam score reports, and naturally none of these rich kids had good grades. Each one got a headache looking at their scores. But Dino was different. His GPA was significantly higher than the other fools. Yellowhead started panicking. If his dad found out about his grades, he could forget about getting any more money. That's when Nano said she had a way to solve the problem. Just come to her consulting office. So they all went to Nano's office, looking for a solution. It would cost a bit, but to them, that was just pocket change. 
So Yellowhead paid the fee, and Nano took his report card and shredded it. From the printer on the other side, a new report card was printed with a forged teacher's signature. Voila, a brand new report card with a higher GPA fresh out of the printer. They felt it was worth it. From then on, there was always a long queue outside her office, as word of Nano's capabilities had spread. There was nothing she couldn't accomplish, just things you hadn't thought of yet. Here you could pay someone to take a punch for you, but it was with real fists, not like in a game. You could even pay for a girlfriend, who would also be quite cute. Almost everyone at the school had sought Nano's services, except for Dino. Everyone thought Dino was too rich to have any problems, but it was the female classmate who needed Nano's help. She wanted to take an overnight trip and asked Nano to fool her parents with a fake permission slip. When the others heard, they wanted to join the fun, starting a discussion about which country to visit. However, Dino didn't want to go abroad, leading everyone to assume he was tired of it since he'd been everywhere. They had to think of another place, and that's when Nano suggested visiting Dino's home. Dino quickly made excuses about his home being ordinary, but his friends had heard rumors of a pool, golf, and many other amenities at his place, sparking their interest. Despite his efforts to dissuade them, they persuaded him to agree. His friends were excited, calling dibs on the rooms. While everyone else walked home, Dino was the only one with a personal driver for pickup and drop-off, fitting the image of a rich kid. But when they arrived, the driver asked for money. He wasn't a private chauffeur, just a regular taxi driver, and the rundown place they arrived at was Dino's real home. It turns out, Dino wasn't rich. His parents sold wholesale food and were deep in debt. He had pretended to be wealthy to befriend those rich kids so he wouldn't be looked down upon. Nano's presence almost exposed his lies, so he hastily made up excuses to keep his friends from visiting. If they found out the truth, he feared he would end up friendless. The female classmate had already decided what to wear to his house, and the rest were equally enthusiastic. Dino felt he couldn't refuse them any longer and thought of a solution, to rent a mansion for a day. However, the cost was too steep for Dino. Nano demanded payment by the next day, increasing his stress. He eyed his parents' savings, stealthily taking the wallet from atop the fridge, money meant for his father's year-end bonus and to pay off loan sharks, but failing to pay would lead to mob retaliation. Upon hearing this, Dino put the money back. He didn't want to put his parents in danger. Yet the thought of his friends discovering the truth haunted him more than the danger to his parents. So at night, he took his dad's bank card and sneaked out, withdrawing the money and returning as if nothing had happened. He thought he had cleverly replaced the wallet without anyone noticing. But then, his dad appeared, giving Dino a scare. He quickly pretended to be pouring water, and his dad was a step too late to realize anything, allowing Dino to narrowly escape disaster. The next day, the dad had already noticed the missing money. Dino's guilty expression was spot on. Of course, his parents couldn't fathom the money just disappearing into thin air, let alone suspect their son had stolen it. But the most pressing matter for Dino was to deceive his friends. Nano had found him a grand villa, which he even thought was a bit too modest, fooling himself in the process. Not long after, Dino brought his friends to the house. The place had facilities even more luxurious than their own homes. Dino started to play his part, truly acting like the master of the house. The others looked on with envy. Yellowhead wanted to try a cigar and Nano suggested it would be better with whiskey, which could be easily arranged by ringing for the servants. Dino took the bell and gave it a shake, but was shocked at the scene before him. His parents were dressed up as servants, which he had been completely unaware of. He never expected his parents to play the role of servants, and out of pride, he didn't acknowledge them. At that moment, the female classmate was curious about what Dino's parents looked like, since he always boasted about them being Thai diplomats. Dino panicked. Just as he was about to look for a photo, Yellowhead ordered the servants around, asking them to find a picture of Dino's parents. The situation was dripping with irony, but to protect their son, his parents found a suitable photo to show the friends, barely getting through the ordeal. With the mansion rented, the food naturally had to be top-notch. The friends toasted over the feast before them, but after taking a sip, they realized it wasn't whiskey. Dino's dad thought they were too young to drink and objected, but the classmates retorted, asking why a servant was making such a fuss about whether they drank or not. Watching his parents being insulted, Dino chose to remain silent. To avoid embarrassing Dino further, his dad had to serve them the real whiskey. Noticing there wasn't much entertainment at the table, Nano suggested they smoke to really get the party started. Dino hadn't expected things to escalate this far, but the pace was now firmly controlled by Nano, and he couldn't stop the reckless behavior of these crazies. Yellowhead then offered Dino a turn, while his parents could hardly bear to watch. 
In their eyes, their previously exemplary son was being led astray by this wild crowd. Dino wanted to help Yellowhead pick up his hat, but Yellowhead commanded Dino's mom to do it instead. Dino watched his mother being humiliated. His mom was thinking of pouring them wine, but accidentally spilled it on the female classmate, which enraged the friends to the point of leaving the table. The mom wanted to say something to Dino, but he left without turning back. After they arrived in the room, it was clear they were still not in good spirits. That's when Nano suggested a fun game to lighten the mood. A gun with one bullet and six chances. Whoever got shot would win. Each person would put up 200,000, point the gun at their arm, and if shot, they would take all the money. Dino couldn't possibly back out at that moment. He had to agree and go along with it. Yellowhead was the first to fire the gun. Naturally, he didn't hit the mark. The others, resolute, took their turn at the trigger. Whether getting shot was a stroke of luck or misfortune for them was anyone's guess. Then it was Nano's turn. She pointed the gun at her head and pulled the trigger, but it's safe. Now it was Dino's turn, and the only bullet was left for the last round. His friends cheered him on to hurry up and shoot. Just as he was about to pull the trigger, Yellowhead suggested he put the gun in his mouth instead. That's when Dino's dad couldn't watch anymore. He couldn't bear his son nearly dying right there. If he hadn't intervened in time, his son would have been a goner. Yellowhead, furious, attacked Dino's dad with a weapon. Dino finally came to his senses and stopped Yellowhead from continuing the assault. However, his dad had already been knocked out. Yellowhead didn't plan to stop there. He continued to wield the gun, striking Dino's mom as well. Both parents ended up on the ground. Yellowhead panicked, while Nano watched the drama unfold from behind. After the mansion fiasco ended, Dino returned to his own home. His parents, bruised and battered, looked at him but didn't blame him. Instead, they were concerned about how much fun their son had. It was only then that Dino realized that his parents were the best things in his life, and he broke down in tears. The story ends on what seems to be a warm note. In reality, Yellowhead dished out 350000 in hush money. Faced with such hard-earned cash, Dino's parents choose the money over their dignity. The fifth episode shifts to a famous school where student Han, the drumming boy, is the most popular influencer. Almost all the girls and even some boys are his fans, basking in the attention that fame brings. Then Nano bursts in and interacts with him, a rare sight of her being so energetic. The atmosphere turned awkward when no one recognized Nano, but that didn't matter to her because she would soon get the party started again. Han and Nano's interaction has caught their classmates' attention, sensing a couple's vibe. They even coined a ship name for them, Han No, which was catchy and pleased the CP fans. They posed with heart signs, making others believe they were a couple, and their photos on social media gathered a following, with their likes constantly rising. But an angry emoji appeared on the screen, and the mood in the comments shifted. Not everyone was on board with the Han No ship, especially since the girl Yui was Han's official girlfriend. They kept their relationship a secret, fearing that going public would cost Han his popularity. Nano's sudden rise didn't diminish Han's fame. It actually increased it, leaving Yui feeling downhearted. She went to the laundry room alone, weighed down with sadness. Han rushed to comfort her, assuring that their relationship was still strong and that he hadn't abandoned her for Nano. Jealousy was a normal reaction, and Yui no longer wanted to see any pictures of them making heart signs. However, Han argued that without those pictures, the likes would cease. He was simply capitalizing on his trend with Nano, and once it faded, no one would care. His true love was still Yui. He was about to kiss her to seal his reassurance when a message came that disturbed him, saying that Nano had vanished and everyone wanted Han to lead the search for her. At that moment, a burst of shouting came from the bathroom. It turned out they started acting out a comedy scene. Nano was locked inside. Han kicked the door powerfully, almost wrecking his own leg. But with so many people watching, he couldn't lose face continuously. The classmates outside the restroom were all anticipating a heroic rescue. Yui hurried over upon seeing the commotion. The outcome indeed did not disappoint them. Han gently placed Nano on the ground. As soon as she woke up, she clung to him tightly. The timing was perfect. The crowd around started to cheer again. Yui watched uncomfortably. At that moment, the cameraman suggested that they should be together. Han was still trying to extricate himself, but didn't expect Nano to be so proactive, immediately asking if he had a girlfriend. To maintain his popularity, Han chose to hide the truth. Although Yui anticipated he would say that, it still saddened her. However, the next scene completely devastated her. 
Han took the initiative to ask Nano if she wanted to be his girlfriend. Nano agreed to his proposal, with one condition that he never leaves her. The classmates were struck by the sweetness of their words. Cheers for the couple erupted once again, leaving Yui alone, hurt. Soon, Han's fan base grew rapidly. Even the teachers were shipping them. The classmates also highly approved of the couple, even creating exclusive merchandise for them. Their faces were printed on pillows and various items. But of course, the most terrifying thing was the mask, half Han, half Nano. These classmates have completely turned into mindless fans. They even sing and dance along while watching their videos, as if it were a festival. By evening, Han finally had time to contact Yui. He was still consoling her that all this was fake, but he even forgot about their evening date. Just as he was about to leave, Nano unexpectedly arrived at the boys' dormitory. With the camera rolling, Han was too embarrassed to send her away, once again letting down Yui. Following that episode, the two's interactions became increasingly frequent. Nano went out of her way to cook meals for Han. They were nearly indistinguishable from a real couple. Although it was all a facade by Nano, Han really hit the jackpot. Gradually, everyone began wearing that bizarre mask. Han and Nano once again danced together joyfully, with even more physical contact. But in Yui's eyes, they were nothing but a pair of shameless lovebirds. So she ran off to the laundry room and ended up arguing with Han. But Han kept feeding her pies in the sky, saying that this was all fake and she was her true love. He promised that he would break it off with Nano within two days. Clearly, Yui was already brainwashed and her mood stabilized. Seeing Han's earnest expression, Yui decided to give him another chance. They attempted to steal a kiss, which, of course, got interrupted. The timing of these people was impeccable, coming in just when things got too quiet. Nano started her performance, acting for all the world like it was real. Han wanted to quickly put an end to everything. He revealed to Nano the truth about his relationship with Yui, how he only wanted to use Nano to gain followers, and now he felt very sorry about it. Of course, he couldn't get away with it. Nano's true nature was fully exposed. It was all part of her plan. If Han dared to break up with her, she would expose everything about Yui, ensuring both of them would be ruined. Han was so angry he wanted to say something, but couldn't come up with any solution to deal with Nano. He was left in furious impotence. On the other side, Yui had already been blasted by the couple's fans online. Her photos were being shared as various memes, each one more outrageous than the last. Not a single person at school was willing to talk to her, leaving Han as her only source of support. Meanwhile, Han was plotting revenge against Nano. The two finally reached an agreement and together forced Nano out. While Nano was playing basketball, a trainee who had practiced for two and a half years charged at her. This was all orchestrated by Yui, who had arranged for the trainee to get close to Nano on purpose and then secretly took photos. Yui printed all these photos and plastered them on the school walls, hoping to destroy Nano's reputation. But she didn't notice someone was taking photos of her in the act. When she turned around, she saw a crowd of people wearing Hanno masks, their phones held high. They wouldn't allow any harm to come to their shipped couple, their phone cameras were their eyes. As a result, when Yui went to eat the next day, all her classmates treated her like an enemy. She couldn't take it anymore and tried to fight back, but of course she faced a ruthless beating. Han just stood by quietly, never daring to protect her. Yui had had enough of this life and was determined to fight back, but the Hanno fans closed in on her step by step, cornering her. She was left with nothing but painful torture, beaten until she was black and blue. It was then that Han finally came to his senses, thinking that if Nano were gone, it would all be over and they could be free. So Han left a note for Nano, asking her to meet him on the roof. Nano disdainfully tossed the note aside, but on the rooftop, it was Yui who lay in wait. Nano knew what the two were up to, but with her indomitable nature, she went to face them head on. As soon as she peeked out, Yui knocked her out with a stick. It seemed like everything was going according to plan. Below, the Hanno fans were still happily chatting when suddenly a loud noise startled everyone. Nano lay there, bloodied on the ground. This was Han's cue to make his entrance and harvest the outcome. He quickly pretended to be heartbroken and picked up Nano without shedding a crocodile tear, his acting far from convincing. Seeing Han's effort, everyone still encouraged him to be strong. His goal was achieved, and soon Nano was taken away by an ambulance, with everyone bidding her a sad farewell. After everything ended, Yui sat on the ground in a daze, and Han came over happily, thinking they were finally free from Nano's entanglement. They had their next moves planned out, just acting sad would do. Then the phone rang, signaling that things were far from over. The Hanno fans stared ahead, looking at that face for too long really could give them nightmares.
As they turned their heads, Han emerged from the crowd. The doctor announced that Nano was lucky to be alive, but would be in a vegetative state for life, needing someone to care for her forever. The crowd behind started to stir, suggesting that Han would definitely take care of her since he had promised to always be together. From the moment he got involved with Nano, his life was over, and now his days would be spent with her. Yui, hiding in the back, remembered something Nano had once thanked her for letting her be with Han forever. It turns out Nano had ensured her permanent presence with Han through her attempted suicide. They thought that killing Nano would set them free, but in reality, it was the beginning of agony. The sixth episode shifts to a girl known as Bam, who managed the school's soccer team. She adored the team captain named O, oh, showing him clear favoritism, which caused dissatisfaction among the other team members. Bam was unconcerned. Her focus was solely on the boy she liked. However, O oh was indifferent to her fervent affections, finding them burdensome and kept her at arm's length. Then, a beautiful girl appeared, capturing everyone's attention with O oh showing distinct interest, unlike his treatment of Bam. This girl, Nano, was harmless and cheerful, which ignited Bam's jealousy as O oh had never looked at her with such fondness. The entire team liked Nano for her beauty and impartiality. Even O oh made efforts to please her, which irritated Bam. As her jealousy grew, Bam decided to bully Nano, assigning her menial tasks like fetching balls and water. However, O oh couldn't stand by and came to help, leaving with Nano, a sight that made Bam bitterly jealous. Steaming with rage, she vented on the wall in the restroom, writing a curse on Nano to smell like a bitch. For Bam, it was merely for fun, a private thrill. But as luck would have it, Nano walked in just as Bam exited. Bam rolled her eyes and walked away, while Nano, feigning innocence, noticed the writing on the wall. However, she knew Bam had fallen right into the trap she set. The next day, as Bam walked past Nano, she noticed a foul smell and thought it might be an unclean towel. However, after sniffing, she realized the towel was odorless. Turning her attention to Nano and moving closer, she found the stench so overwhelming it almost made her vomit. When the other team members arrived, they too were struck by the unbearable odor and assumed Bam had passed gas, leaving her unable to defend herself. Then, O came over for a drink of water, and Nano kindly brought it to him, but he was also repelled by the smell and hastily retreated. At that moment, Bam remembered the words she'd written in the bathroom and went back, wondering if the wall really did have power. She decided to write something new, for O to like her. After all, there was nothing to lose and everything to gain if it came true. After school, as a teacher approached Bam for a talk, a soccer ball flew towards her. In a critical moment, O stepped in front to shield her. Looking at his handsome face, Bam was so excited that she got a nosebleed, thinking that her wish on the wall had come true so quickly. But then O clarified he wasn't asking her, but someone else, and the teacher said they were fine, thanking him. Embarrassed, Bam thought she could dig a hole with her foot. A senior classmate saw this and mocked Bam, suggesting she couldn't really believe O would protect her, as that was impossible. He said if he had to choose between saving her or a dog from a ball, he'd save the dog. Then he added insult to injury by saying that when girls give him sidelong glances, he finds it cute, but when Bam does it, it is truly horrifying, implying she wasn't seen as a girl at all. So Bam made a wish for the senior classmate to act like a rabid dog, and his behavior soon outdid any dogs, looking for smelly turds. Bam looked on with satisfaction as the senior classmate was eventually taken to the hospital, and she felt the thrill of power, already thinking of her next target. Upon returning home, she tried using pens of various colors to practice. Her sister immediately sensed something was off, but still cared for her deeply, especially since their mother was often away from home, and it was her sister who looked after her. The following day, Bam returned to the familiar bathroom and was about to write something when she heard a commotion outside. A girl was being bullied in the bathroom, curled up in the corner, too afraid to make a sound. Bam went out to comfort her, suggesting that if she really hated someone, she should write it on the wall and her wish would come true. But naturally, the girl was skeptical at first because such a tale sounded too far-fetched. Bam bought a heap of water and headed to the soccer field. Seeing this, O ran over, but he wasn't running towards her. Instead, he was drawn to Nano, who now had no odor at all. The senior student had also been discharged from the hospital and was no longer acting like a rabid dog. Bam wondered if the wishes had stopped working, so she hurried to the bathroom to check. It turned out the cleaner had wiped the writing off the wall. Bam thought the cleaner might know about the magical wall and was trying to stop her from using it. So Bam begged her to stop cleaning and shared the secret of the magic wall, suggesting she try it out if she didn't believe it. 
The cleaner thought Bam was treating her like a fool and that Bam might be a bit crazy. Bam was at a loss. However, the cleaner ended up telling the teachers about it. Bam was furious inside, so when no one was around, she wrote something new on the wall. Soon after, there was a commotion at the school. Bam realized something bad had happened as students looked on in horror. The cleaner had apparently hanged herself. No one could understand why she would take her own life, but Bam knew why. She had written on the wall, wanting the meddlesome cleaner to choke to death. O was still in shock and hadn't recovered when the bullied girl appeared. She had seen the writing on the wall and knew that Bam was responsible for the cleaner's death. After that, Bam couldn't sleep well at night, feeling guilty whenever she thought about having killed someone. She hadn't expected the wall's power to go that far. Unable to bear it, she wiped the deadly words away with a towel. As soon as she did, the school was abuzz with talk that the cleaner had come back to life, sitting up as if nothing had happened, and Bam's guilt dissipated. But her good mood didn't last long when she saw Nano and O getting close, with O even trying to hug her. Bam's mood turned to rage. Shortly after, Nano ran out covering her face, the result of Bam's handiwork on the wall, where she wrote that Nano should have a face like the surface of the moon. Walking down the street, Bam was shocked to see the cleaner alive and well. The cleaner looked at Bam, who ran away in fear. Back at home, Bam wanted to find out how the cleaner had survived the hanging, but her computer suddenly went black. That night, as she slept, she saw the cleaner staring at her. When she looked again, Nano was also there, scaring her. Bam woke up with a start, relieved it was just a nightmare, but it was only the beginning of her nightmares. During class, a shadow drifted by and a student jumped off the windowsill, dying on impact. It turned out the bullied girl had taken action, using the wall to make others end their own lives. Bam never imagined that the wish-granting wall would become a tool for murder. As she thought about going out, other students were heading towards the back stall, and more and more people became aware of the magic wall. The entire school was about to face a great disaster. A female classmate was eating her meal as normal when suddenly she picked up her bowl and began to dance wildly with excitement, as if possessed and unstoppable. It was all because someone had cursed her to become a madwoman. Then, another girl was being chased by a group of boys who were pursuing her like predators, all because someone had cursed her, calling her a loose woman. Others were biting like dogs, their jealousy turning them into something unrecognizable. The most outrageous incident was the sudden death of the principal, which of course happened because the vice principal wanted to seize power. The graffiti on the walls kept multiplying. Bam went to the bathroom and the wall was nearly covered in curses, all harmful, just like when Bam had first used the wall. To her surprise, she noticed the curse on O, wishing him to cripple. Worried, Bam hurried to find O. She urged O not to play, fearing he'd get hurt. O thought she was being ridiculous, but in an instant, his leg became lame without any warning. Just then, Bam noticed a pen had fallen to the floor, realizing a teammate wanted to take over as captain from O. A mere sentence had made it so easy. Seeing her beloved O like this, she couldn't hold back her fury. Only then did she remember she could erase the curse, but she couldn't bring herself to do it because the wall said that anyone who cleaned it would die. She couldn't sacrifice her life even for the one she loved. Watching O now confined to a wheelchair, perhaps she finally felt sorry. Then Nano came over. She mustered the courage to apologize to Nano and admitted that everything was her fault. Nano's signature laugh signaled the end of her performance, revealing the real Nano. She accused Bam of cursing her and the senior classmate. Everyone who wrote on the wall was once good, and it's all Bam's fault, and she destroyed O herself. Bam was cornered by Nano's words and resolved to clean the wall no matter what. Nano loudly announced that Bam was going to clean the wall, causing those who had written on it to panic. They collectively rushed to stop her. Bam sprinted to the bathroom, locked the door, and the crowd surged to prevent her. But no matter how hard she scrubbed, she couldn't erase the words. As the crowd was about to break in, Bam hastily wrote something on the wall, and in an instant, everyone vanished. The school became silent. Not a soul was in sight wherever Bam went. But Nano would never disappear. She stood still, watching her. Bam ran alone to the empty soccer field, shouting loudly, hoping for a response. But the world was left with only her because she had written. She wished everyone would disappear. Bam returned home in solitude, tried to make a call on her phone, but all her contacts had suddenly vanished. She had also lost her friends and family, but that sentence said everyone would disappear. So what would happen to her? In the end, all that awaited her was a sorrowful disappearance from the world. The seventh episode begins with a student, TK, transferring to a new high school after being expelled for stealing. 
The principal was not pleased, saying they couldn't accept such problematic students at their school. The butler, foreseeing this, had already pulled out a check for $500,000 to hand to the principal, who claimed he was no longer that kind of person and hated bribery the most. But when the butler brought out a case filled with one million, the principal's demeanor quickly changed, saying that their school loves to take in such problematic students. TK always transferred schools this way, being born in a rich family, where money could solve almost all problems except the loneliness in his heart. Nano transferred to TK's class, and he recognized her at a glance, but due to his reclusive nature, he didn't like initiating conversations. His classmates also kept their distance, thinking of him as nothing more than a scary thief. Nano, however, didn't see him that way and wanted to get to know this adorable thief, because peers can always share insights. After school, the only place TK would go was the rooftop, yet someone had the audacity to intrude. TK didn't expect to find someone doing the same thing as him there, and Nano was clearly better at thieving. Nano advised him to stop using outdated methods, which was why he got caught, and suggested he learn from her instead. She then showed him her freshly stolen loot, and even proposed a challenge to TK. A competition that was theirs alone, marking the beginning of their love story, which started to sprout from this very encounter. Brushing past a girl was all Nano needed to swipe a wallet, while TK stuck to the most traditional pickpocketing techniques, only to find the pocket he targeted was empty. Nano, on the other hand, always came away with a full haul. TK wasn't one to accept defeat easily. As a boy walked by with earphones in, TK passed him, and the earphones naturally ended up around his own neck. He thought his technique was unbeatable until Nano managed to lift a speaker system with a simple turn. Watching Nano strut around with the stolen sound system, TK felt a wave of defeat once again. The teacher was ready to distribute the results of the last exam when suddenly the papers were nowhere to be found. The teacher thought they'd been left in the office, never suspecting they would turn up out of Nano's bag. This time, TK was outplayed by Nano in the craft. No matter how he tried, he couldn't outsteal her. So they decided to join forces, combining their strengths to become an unstoppable duo. They ventured off campus to steal drinks, with TK's speed giving them the edge to make a quick getaway. They hid in a dark corner, TK cracking open a can of cola, with Nano following suit, shaking hers vigorously. Once strangers, they quickly became familiar with each other, appearing in each other's worlds. Perhaps their shared loneliness was what made Nano decide to let her guard down and enjoy the company of the boy before her, even going out of her way to make him laugh. Nano filled both TK's eyes and heart, but sadly, his affection was for the wrong person. Their relationship clearly took a turn for the intimate. In class, to avoid the teacher's notice, they exchanged notes, a silly act many have done with their crushes in their younger days. There's nothing quite like the sweetness of youthful affection. This time, they decided to go big and steal the principal's most expensive painting. The area was riddled with cameras, and even TK couldn't think of a way around them, but Nano was unstoppable. She had already obtained the surveillance footage and knew the blind spots of every camera, which allowed them to successfully make off with the painting. When the principal discovered the painting was missing, he ordered the teachers to check each student's belongings. Naturally, the focus was on TK, whose reputation was well known throughout the school. However, when the teacher inspected his backpack, it turned up empty. The suspicion then shifted to Nano. Upon opening her bag, out flew a balloon, and the classroom erupted with laughter at her expense. They surely stashed their spoils in a secret hideout, but Nano wasn't fond of the flowers. She simply relished the thrill of a successful theft. So she decided to show TK what she truly cherished. Taking him to her warehouse, Nano played with the stolen goods alongside TK. Each item she pilfered was worth millions. The hat of Charlie Chaplin, a limited edition coat, and even this massive diamond, all were the work of Nano's hands. To display his own capabilities, TK brought her to his home. In the dimly lit small room, they shared their true hormone feelings. TK was grateful for Nano's friendship. He had always been a loner. Nano's sudden appearance brought color to his world. As for Nano, she had always lurked in the shadows, never truly opening up to anyone. TK's presence had lit up her heart in a way. By this time, TK had fallen deeply for Nano. He had a premonition that Nano might one day disappear suddenly, so he wished that she wouldn't vanish. Clearly moved by his heartfelt declaration, Nano replied that she would not go anywhere. However, TK intertwined her fingers with his, feeling the sincerity in Nano's heart. Nano admitted it was fun to be with him, a bold confession for her. Then, Nano suddenly offered to let him meet his father. 
Since his dad was always busy earning money and had never cared for TK, the boy had always lacked paternal affection. He truly longed for his father's company. Nano concocted a plan to steal something important. The principal often accepted bribes from students' families, not for improving the school or their living conditions, but for his own pocket. Nano planned to steal this money to serve justice. There was a hidden door behind the principal's office, and inside, a safe stuffed with bribe money. All they needed to do was learn how to crack the safe to retrieve it smoothly. But when it came time to act, TK got cold feet. After all, he'd never stolen real cash before. Nano was a bit disdainful of his cowardice. TK didn't want his beloved to get hurt, so he agreed to go with her on one condition. If they got caught, just let him take the blame. Nano was touched by his words and found herself at a loss for a rebuttal. Never had anyone been willing to sacrifice everything for her. So without further ado, she gave TK a deep kiss, the greatest gift Nano could offer. What does the ambiguity of adolescence feel like? It's a defining kiss on the rooftop, a wild revelry between two people in the night and the naive promises made in youth. Yet none of this can avoid the inevitable goodbyes. In the evening, after the principal locked up the safe and left, TK descended slowly from the ceiling. Nano was outside, directing his movements. TK was in charge of sneaking in, and he successfully made his way to the front of the safe. Taking out the tools he had prepared, he pried open the safe. In no time at all, he had it open, but inside there was only a document. Suddenly, a hand took it from him. TK was panic-stricken by the turn of events. The principal had returned with the police to catch the thief, but he didn't plan to catch TK immediately. Instead, he wanted to have a private word with him. The principal said that they could overlook what had just happened, but naturally there was a solution that TK would understand. As for how much it would cost, that would depend on his father's sincerity. TK didn't want to be controlled by the principal, so he threatened not to think about taking any money because he had evidence of the principal taking bribes on tape. But of course the principal had an ace up his sleeve. Nano suddenly appeared in front of TK, returning all the surveillance recordings to the principal. TK showed his unsettled state. At that moment, the butler came in again, which meant more money for the principal. This time, the enraged TK snatched the check and ripped it in two, also landing a solid punch on the principal. Because of his irrational behavior, TK was sent to juvenile detention for reform, but he was out in a few days. After all, money can solve many problems. Just then, a figure appeared before him. He finally saw his long-lost father, but he had grown accustomed to saying the opposite of what he felt, outwardly claiming he didn't want to see his father, while inwardly wanting it more than anything. He walked past his father, feigning strength, but his father's soft words made him break down completely. He cried out and embraced his father. It was a bittersweet moment, the only way for father and son to meet. While he was happy to see his father, TK felt a profound emptiness. Memories of Nano and all their moments together flooded back, filled with regret. So TK went to the warehouse to find her. Standing before a famous painting, he finally saw Nano. She explained why she had exposed him. It was to ensure he saw his father. TK understood her actions, but what mattered now was keeping her with him. However, that was impossible. Nano never belonged to this world. Even though she had been moved by mortal emotions, their story was doomed from the start. Their last intense eye contact marked the end of their brief, passionate ambiguity. This was the feeling of unrequited love, something most people have likely experienced. Despite mutual affection, they were forced apart by various circumstances. The eighth episode begins with a female student walking along a path on the campus with her hands covered in trash bags. Suddenly, a sharp knife protruded from one of the bags, and she used it to stab other students. The campus was filled with dreadful screams of agony. On the other side of the campus, student Go was detained by a teacher for not doing his homework. Known as the school's notorious troublemaker, talking to him was utterly pointless. His daily hobby was to butt heads with the teacher. Infuriated, the teacher wanted to throw the chalk eraser at Go, but he refrained as it could lead to complaints from parents. The only option was to keep him back. Besides, the teacher's own daughter attended the school. If necessary, everyone could spend the evening together. The other two were not pleased since they had their own matters to attend to. However, the teacher was resolute. Nobody could leave until Go finished his homework. In desperation, one girl wanted to help him write it, but the teacher wouldn't allow it. Just then, the teacher's daughter arrived in the classroom, which meant he was in no hurry anymore. There was plenty of time to spend there. Suddenly, a bespectacled girl rushed into the room in a panic, urging them to lock the door quickly. A couple also ran in hurriedly, demanding the door be shut. 
As the girl was about to close the door, Nano entered at the last moment, and the student who ran in said that a fugitive had gone on a killing spree in the school, having already slain several people. They had no choice but to flee here. The teacher asked the students to remain calm and barricade the door with desks to prevent the assailant from entering easily. They also covered the windows with cardboard, securing temporary safety. While everyone was thinking about how to survive, Go's rebellious spirit flared up. He didn't believe the others and decided to go out and see for himself. Right then, the campus-wide announcement system came to life with a grave message. There truly was a fugitive disguised in a student uniform, wreaking havoc and killing indiscriminately. The warning advised all students not to wander alone and to wait for rescue in a safe place. This caused even Go to sober up and take the situation seriously. A big-mouthed girl tried to use her big mouth to call for help on her cell phone, but there was no signal at all, and it was the same with everyone else's phones. That's when Nano suddenly claimed she had seen some information about the murderer, showing a photo to the others. Then the bespectacled girl received a message saying that the killer was drawing near to their floor, which sent everyone into a panic. Even the teacher's daughter was so scared she was close to crying. Suddenly, they thought they heard footsteps outside. Everyone quickly covered their chicken mouths, too frightened to make a chicken sound. Indeed, several shadows flitted past the door. Just when they thought they were safe, a loud banging on the door startled everyone to wet their pants inside, sending them scurrying to the side. However, it turned out to be other survivors outside who were trying to find refuge. Seeing the situation, the big mouth girl wanted to open the door to save them, but the teacher stopped her. No one could be certain if the ones outside were actual students or the fugitive in disguise. For the safety of everyone in the classroom, the door couldn't be opened. Go felt that the chicken cries for help were likely from real students and argued that not helping them was as bad as leaving them to die. But nobody had concrete evidence. The teacher was adamant, especially with his daughter present. He was unwilling to open the door. At this point, Go took on the mantle of a hero, determined to open the door. Other students were also eager to help, but the teacher stood his ground, ready to use force if necessary to protect his daughter. Nano then intervened, urging them to stop fighting and take a look for themselves. The students peered under the door and saw an eye staring intently back at them, which made them recoil in fear. Because of the earlier argument between Go and the teacher, they missed the chance to pull the students outside to safety, leading to a gruesome outcome as the fugitive killed one of them. This reignited the argument. The teacher insisted he wanted to protect everyone in the classroom, which is why he couldn't just open the door. Go, however, felt the teacher only cared about his own daughter and didn't give a damn about anyone else. In the end, it was a stalemate with each side sticking to their own reasoning and beginning to blame each other. Student Shaw criticized her boyfriend for not running out of the school, but he was speechless, pointing out that they were at least in a safe place and told her to stop with the hindsight bias. The teacher tried to comfort his daughter that everything would be okay. Witnessing this, Go got even more agitated, making increasingly offensive remarks towards the teacher and his daughter. The teacher couldn't hold back any longer. He punched Go in the face. Nano suggested that everyone find something to defend themselves with, so they all started searching the classroom. Nano found a utility knife, but the teacher snatched it without a second thought, simply believing that he was the strongest there and therefore had the responsibility to use the weapon to protect everyone. Shaw found weapons for everyone, even for the noisy Go and his friends, and they stayed put until nightfall. Even though it was quiet outside, they dared not leave. At this point, the teacher's daughter said she was hungry. The teacher asked if anyone had anything to eat, or even just some water would do. Shaw instinctively reached for the water but was stopped by her boyfriend. The teacher asked them to give the child some water to drink, but the boyfriend firmly said they didn't have any. When pushed to the brink, everyone is a selfish creature. No one wants to sacrifice themselves for others. And to protect his daughter, the teacher forcefully searched through the boy's backpack, but found no water. That's when Go threw his water bottle on the ground. It turned out he had sneakily taken it while standing behind Shaw. With no recourse, the others could only continue waiting quietly. Now, the outside had become much quieter. Go felt this was the best chance to escape. However, they wanted Go to go out and scout first, then find someone to rescue them. Go was definitely not happy about that. Then, the teacher suggested they vote on who should go out. Almost everyone voted for Go except for Shaw. She felt it wasn't fair to Go. Her boyfriend felt jealous. This wasn't the first time she had helped Go. But based on the majority rules, the teacher decided Go should go. Go was furious, thinking that if he got out, he certainly wouldn't find anyone to rescue them. They could just quietly wait for death here. 
Nano also spoke up for Go, saying it was too pitiful for him to go out alone. Then the other students started guilt-tripping, saying if Nano felt sorry for him, she should go with him to find help. Nano retorted, saying she hadn't figured out why she should help them. That left everyone speechless. Shaw's boyfriend tried to use the child to guilt-trip Nano, but he himself hadn't even given the child water, which was truly ironic. In the face of danger, everyone only thought about self-preservation. No one preferred to actively seek help, preferring to wait for rescue instead. That's when the teacher spoke up, promising that if someone found help, he would ensure Go could smoothly pass this school year. This tempted Go. So after some thought, he decided to go out, but he insisted that the Big Mouth girl open the door first. The girl didn't think much and went to carefully open the door to check outside, when suddenly Go pushed her out and quickly locked the door behind her. In this way, Go took his revenge on the girl who had been all talk. The other students were now too scared to make any chicken noise. At that moment, the Big Mouth girl started a video call from outside. She was alone, exploring, and it wasn't clear what she had seen, but she started running forward like a mad cow as if she had gone mad. The call suddenly lost signal midway, leaving the girl's fate unknown. The other students were concerned about her and insisted that Go should go out to save her Big Mouth. Go couldn't be bothered to argue with them. Debating was a waste of time when he could be escaping. So Go left the classroom immediately. The teacher quickly relocked the door. Shaw called him to confirm the situation, begging Go to look for help, but Go didn't want to assist them. Shaw pleaded, asking if he would do it for her sake. Her boyfriend didn't want to stay there any longer, so he rushed out, ignoring the teacher's attempts to stop him. As things escalated, Nano began to take control of the situation. She kept provoking the teacher, saying that if the student who had just run out came to harm, he would bear a significant responsibility. After some deep thought, the teacher decided to go out and seek help. He left his daughter in the care of others, and the last man in the classroom left, leaving only the girls, who were understandably afraid. Then Nano suddenly started laughing. They all remembered the photo Nano had with her. The hairstyle was identical to hers, indicating that she might be the fugitive. But Nano had been with them the whole time. How could she possibly kill from afar? Just then, Shaw heard Go's cries. Worried that something had happened to the people outside, they couldn't help but follow. Shaw led them out, but they soon realized this was not a safe path. Shaw wanted to secretly find Go, but the others quickly left her behind to fend for herself. At that moment, a figure from behind embraced Shaw. It was the Big Mouth girl who had been pushed out earlier. She was yelling that something had happened to Go. Everyone followed Shaw to the restroom, and as soon as they opened the door, they screamed like chickens. Go was lying inside, covered in blood. The teacher and Shaw's boyfriend also rushed over. They all thought the fugitive had killed Go. But then the news on TV reported that the fugitive had fallen from a building and died during his escape, before Go's death. So what was the situation with the female student lying on the ground at that time? At that moment, the girl appeared from the neighboring classroom, merely having fainted due to an asthma attack. This means that someone else was responsible for Go's murder. Perhaps it was Shaw's boyfriend who lost his sanity out of jealousy. Or maybe it was the teacher, afraid that Go would leak the details of the incident to the public. Or possibly it was the Big Mouth girl, seeking revenge because Go had pushed her out. The real culprit was uncertain. Everyone had a strong motive. The ninth episode begins with a teacher named Miss Alm, who greeted the students at the school gate with other teachers, but she felt it was pointless since the students' greetings were insincere. However, the students wielded considerable power here as the school would vote for the most popular teacher based on their satisfaction levels, with the winner enjoying a luxurious trip sponsored by the parents. Hence, Teacher Beauty always wore a smile during class, even engaging in off-topic conversations with students and ignoring others who snuck in snacks or blatantly used their phones. She continued with her lecture, dismissing class before it was even over. But whenever Miss Alm entered, the atmosphere in the class grew instantly serious because she was only interested in teaching earnestly, unlike Teacher Beauty who tried to please the students. When a student tried to chat with Miss Alm about something else, she flatly refused, leaving the student looking visibly disappointed. Miss Alm was soon called to the principal's office because she had only received one vote from the students. The principal thought her teaching methods were too rigid and unpopular with the students. But her sole intention as a teacher was to educate, not to engage in all these frivolous activities, and she was determined not to yield to such rules. Back in the office, her colleagues added insult to injury. 
Her ex-husband had abandoned Miss Alm and their child because of an affair, which happened after a colleague introduced her ex-husband to a tutoring class where he got a female student pregnant. Miss Alm verbally brushed it off as the past, but she was extremely anxious and mentally becoming unstable. Just then, Nano came over to her, expressing her unwavering support. But Miss Alm greeted everyone with a cold face, showing no mercy as she harshly turned Nano away. Back home, her attitude towards her son was also quite alarming. First, she was harsh with him, then suddenly broke into laughter. How was this any different from a mental illness? At the convenience store, the cashier gave her a dollar less in change, and unexpectedly, Miss Alm lost her temper. Even after the cashier corrected the mistake, she didn't let it go and became even angrier, leaving the cashier dumbfounded. During dinner, her son suddenly said he missed his dad and Miss Alm flew into a rage, throwing away all the food and forbidding her son from ever mentioning his father again. Then she clutched her son, trying to brainwash him by calling his dad a scoundrel. Her son was so terrified by her behavior that he burst into tears. Seeing this, Miss Alm hurried to console him, but her mental state was already on the verge of collapse. During class, all the students received a text message. Miss Alm took a look and saw that it was about her ex-husband impregnating a female student. This news was the final straw for her. She fainted suddenly and was taken to the hospital. The principal suggested she take some time off before returning, but Miss Alm claimed she was just tired from researching education reform. The principal dismissed her plans outright, as the school had already decided to go ahead with Teacher Beauty's plan. Miss Alm just needed to focus on being a good teacher, but when she returned, her heart wasn't in her work. Nano once again managed to ignite her rage by continuously provoking her, saying that if Miss Alm became the vice principal, the school would be better off. This was undoubtedly pouring fuel on the fire in her heart. Her notebook was almost torn apart by her pen in a daze. She walked out to see the principal and teacher beauty mercilessly mocking her, students treating her as a joke, and even visions of her ex-husband's affair looking very smug. So with an indifferent expression, she went on a stabbing spree. But in reality, she stabbed a student in the abdomen. She had become a complete madwoman. Needless to say, the outcome was clear. Miss Alm was dismissed. Passing by a classroom, she saw Teacher Beauty giving students the answers. And the advice was just to choose C for everything. What did this kind of teaching have to do with learning? No wonder Miss Alm felt disenchanted with the school. At that moment, Nano stopped her again, urging Miss Alm not to give up on her ideals, warning that otherwise, the education system would become increasingly corrupt and the students would end up as societal refuse. She had to find a way to do something. After returning home, she sat there in a daze alone. The video of her stabbing someone had made the news, inciting a barrage of online abuse. Miss Alm couldn't handle it anymore. The myriad voices pulled her back from her fantasy into reality. It turned out that her son had wanted to go with his father all along. Unable to bear what she saw as her son's betrayal, she smothered him with a pillow, killing him. The interactions she had seen with her son were all in her imagination. Her son had been gone since the moment her ex-husband left. Soon after, the ceremony for the most popular teacher award began, and Miss Alm had become a completely different person. Arriving at the scene, she hummed a tune while picking up a gun. The bullet was aimed at the principal's corruption, Teacher Beauty's vanity, and as for the students, their lackadaisical attitudes. Soon, she had killed everyone in the auditorium. Of course, Nano was also there waiting for her. Miss Alm wanted to kill Nano, who bore a striking resemblance to the student her ex-husband had an affair with, but Nano had always firmly controlled her. Nano said that those who think they are always right are the most pitiable. Miss Alm was thoroughly disarmed by Nano's words, mumbling to herself that she was right, until she completely lost her sanity and ended her own life with a gunshot. Once again, Nano had completed her mission. The tenth episode begins at a rather peculiar school where academic performance is not the priority. Here, good looks are the ticket to success, so much so that the school even has a beauty leaderboard. Girls who rank in the top 10 enjoy privileges and benefits, such as indulging in luxurious afternoon teas. The girl who ranks number one is treated like a queen, basking in the adoration of everyone. But for those who are deemed average-looking, the situation is grim. They endure unpalatable food, use filthy squat toilets, and are peeped at by the gecko while using them. The principal firmly believes that beauty is a woman's everything, proclaiming that there are no ugly women, only lazy ones. Nano certainly would be transferred to this school. Unfortunately, as soon as she arrived, she was scratched by a falling leaf, which ironically suited her just fine. As the new girl, Nano was seated next to Ying, who was ranked 10th on the leaderboard. 
Ying offered her a professional but insincere smile, not out of a desire to make friends, but because she saw Nano as a threat to her ranking. Luckily for Ying, Nano's face was scratched, which made her worry less. She took Nano to the villa reserved for the top ten to enjoy afternoon tea together, where Ying couldn't stop boasting, an attitude that was off-putting to anyone. Dealing with such people was actually Nano's specialty. She began to eat a piece of chocolate, and Ying, enticed by the treat, couldn't resist having a small piece too. At that moment, a greasy girl who idolized Ying burst in. Her dream was to be as beautiful as Ying, who treated her kindly only in pretense and even offered her cake, only for the greasy girl's heavy body to be dragged away by security before she could finish it. Ying relished the feeling of power, although as the 10th ranker she could only exercise it over the average lot. She aspired to be number one, the focus of all the beauty's attention, though she knew she was far from it. When Ying decided to test Nano's beauty score, to her shock, Nano ranked 11th, even with her scratched face. Ying could only imagine what would happen if Nano's face healed. She quickly made an excuse to leave, not realizing she had fallen right into Nano's trap. The next morning, she woke up to find that her rank had dropped out of the top 10. A large pimple had sprouted on her nose overnight. Everyone knows the pimple shouldn't be popped with fingers, but she couldn't resist and ended up squeezing it, causing it to burst. Her nose swelled up as if stung by a bee. Now ranked 11th, she was relegated to the life of an ordinary person, eating unfamiliar food and using dirty toilets. To make matters worse, more and more pimples appeared on her face. Watching her classmates squeeze into the top 10, she fled in embarrassment. When she woke up again, she had plummeted to the 21st rank. Ying couldn't tolerate this outcome, so she went to a convenience store to buy acne cream, only to be caught red-handed by Nano. Feeling ashamed, she donned a mask and ran out. The greasy girl passed by without managing to greet her. At that moment, Nano whispered something in her greasy ear, and the two seemed to share an unspeakable secret. On the other hand, after using countless tubes of acne cream, Ying's face finally cleared up, and her rank shot back up to number 10. Her face lit up with a smile again, but the joy was short-lived as someone else had just taken over the 10th spot. Ying once again lost her place of honor. Just as the security was about to chase her away from her privileges, Nano stepped in to help. As a token of gratitude, Ying even pushed her on the swing. However, as she pushed, Ying became increasingly angry. If she couldn't become more beautiful, she thought, why not make others uglier? So she forcefully pushed Nano to the ground, and her rank was restored. She tasted the thrill of doing harm, but all this was within Nano's expectations. Ying returned to the familiar villa to rest and apply a face mask. The other top ten girls gathered to chat, uniting in bad-mouthing Ying, oblivious to the fact that she was lying on the sofa. Witnessing the repugnant faces of those above her, Ying's dark side was fully awakened, and her plan for revenge began to take shape. The girl ranked sixth was in the bathroom taking a shower. She had a serious allergy to cat fur, so Ying took the opportunity to toss a cat in there, eliminating one rival. The fifth and seventh ranked girls felt their faces itch, and upon dropping their towels, discovered they were crawling with ants. The ninth ranked girl was suddenly knocked out by Ying, who then cut off her beloved pigtails and even shaved off her eyebrows. The fourth and eighth ranked girls were in the middle of an experiment when their lab unexpectedly exploded. After the second and third ranked girls drank their beverages, their faces broke out in a rash of hair, another one of Ying's schemes. The top ranked girl was supposed to promote a certain brand of cream, but Ying secretly switched it with a generic brand, leaving her face as green as the Hulk's. Ying's ruthless tactics effectively wiped out the beauty rankings, and the school fell into disrepair as many began to imitate her behavior, leaving no girl unscathed in appearance. Once the original top-ranked girl recovered, she mocked Ying, who in a fit of anger, painted her face green once again. However, Ying also ended up with a deep bite mark on her face. Afterward, the principal was holding a ceremony to award the top-ranked student. Ying arrived just in time, confidently looking at the audience of beauties she had sabotaged, thinking the top spot was hers for sure. However, the ultimate winner was not her, but a student she had never seen before. The principal invited the girl to speak, and everyone felt she looked familiar. It was then they realized she was the former greasy girl, who had undergone a skinny transformation on a makeover show thanks to Nano's suggestion, emerging as the new number one. After all the trouble Ying caused, it all came to nothing, and she became yet another unfortunate soul to be harshly schooled by Nano. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.